Good evening. Good evening. Let's start the graduation ceremony 2020-2021 of the students' uh, Masters in International Development, International Security, and uh, Business Masters in International Studies. Um, <coughs> before uh, starting uh, my introduction and the welcoming, I just want to say that we have a small change in the, in the program. I must apologize to uh, the rector of the University of Barcelona, who should give uh, the uh, welcome as well, because he is going to arrive a little bit late, but he is going to deliver the, uh, the final words, the closure, together with uh, Professor Narcis Serra, president of eBay. But uh, we prefer to, to start on time, and, and then we'll, we'll start now with the uh, wel welcoming words, my side, and also the uh, introduction, presentation of the, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Morillas. Well, first of all, uh, uh, I want to say that in the name of the Barcelona Institute for International Studies, uh, or the Institute Barcelona de Studies Internacionals, eBay, from the Catalan acronym, uh, as we call actually most of the time, uh, I warmly welcome you, so in the name of eBay faculty, eBay staff, uh, I will really be welcome you uh, to this graduation ceremony for, for the class of the uh, 2020-21 and for the master's students that I referred before. And before introducing uh, Dr. Morillas, uh, I would like to add a few words regarding uh, eBay and your progress during this uh, particularly difficult course uh, 2021 at the, at the Institute. eBay class of... Uh, 2021 has been exceptional uh, for a very basic reason, the COVID-19 pandemic. This was something exceptional in many different uh, dimensions and was has strongly affected our uh, normal academic uh, activity, as you, of course, uh, know, fully know. During this academic year, uh, however, the, the entire EVA community has been committed to, to fighting to fight the COVID and the consequences. And however, we should express our solidarity with all of those uh, who fell ill or who lost loved ones, and there were some cases here in the eBay community, of course. <clears throat> when we started in March uh, 2020, uh, when eBay started in March 2020, few of us could have foreseen the dramatic consequences it has uh, created, uh, and we know now and how strong it will impact our lives and professional activities, and in particular, for the development of teaching activities in higher education institutions, as it is our case uh, at eBay. Uh, and more particularly, maybe at eBay, because of the, we are a very international uh, scholarly community of students coming from uh, 50 different countries and faculty also from more than uh, 10, 15 different countries as well. So it's uh, particularly because of uh, these uh, difficulties, uh, because uh, ties are sometimes in families in other countries or connections, and this creates even more, more stress and, and difficulties. Uh, however, uh, since then, since the starting of the pandemic, and in particular during this course uh, 2021, we have been coping, uh, coping with the circumstances created by the pandemic as much and as well as we have been able I mean to make uh, your learning experience as a master's student at EVA uh, something exceptional, despite all unexpected difficulties. For this reason, I would like you to thank you, the students, as well as the teaching and administrative staff at EVA, for your resilience and adaptability to the difficult situations we have been coping, coping uh, with during these uh, COVID-19 times. <clears throat> during this very difficult academic year, I am sure you have been able, despite all the difficulties, to gain a different view of the world and the international affairs that matters, the topics that you are, have been studying, not only by attending online uh, courses, classes, during a significant part of the, of the year, uh, and also doing uh, online a wide variety of workshops and lectures or following them, also reading papers and writing essays, uh, but also by sharing your personal experience 
virtually or face to face, keeping of course the necessary social distances during, uh, during this, uh, this uh, academic year. Thus, I expect you now perceive the, the complexities uh, and the nuances of international politics and globalization in a way uh, that will seriously support and fuel your professional careers in the, in the years to come. This is what EVA has aimed uh, to deliver to you, uh, providing a, a global thinking from Barcelona, from Catalonia, South Europe, providing you a full learning experience that you allow uh, to understand international relations, security, and development in a much more sophisticated and sensible form, provi providing also the necessary tools to be involved in its uh, transformation in the coming years when you start or develop your professional careers. However, I must confess that Iberi needs your support also in the years to come, including your class. Iberi alumni now is over 1,400 graduates, from more than 80 uh, different countries, maybe uh, 100, I really don't know exactly. Most of them, uh, of the graduates or alumni, uh, are now actively working as professionals in most fields of international affairs and public policy in many cases as well. Graduates are, uh, without doubt, the most important capital of eBay, and we are committed to facilitate uh, your connections and networking to uh, have as much as better uh, professional careers that you can develop in the, in the coming years. And I also are committed to provide you with information and collaboration in, in many different ways through the, the eBay community in the, in the coming years. However, uh, we also need you uh, from now on to continue building a strong professional, personal, intellectual ties in the, uh, around or in the eBay community. We expect that you will help us to make eBay a stronger academic institution, to emerge as one of the major graduate schools in international st studies in Europe of a worldwide reputation. But also, and first of all, we expect uh, that you will keep uh, eBay as a place to come back from time to time, to come to Barcelona, to visit us, and a place to be proud of. So this is our more sincere uh, expectation regarding the eBay, no? that you enjoy your benefit of the studying this year at eBay, but also that you will continue to be members of the eBay community as, as alumni for your entire life. Now I will introduce you our keynote speaker for the graduation lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Morillas. Dr. Morillas is uh, director of CIDO, the Barcelona Center for International Affairs, and as most of you probably know already, after being one year in, in Barcelona and working in international affairs, that CIDOP is a, a, a research center located in Barcelona. It's a, almost 50 years old, a very long historical tradition of doing research in international relations and related issues. And it's a think tank of international projection and amazing reputation very well connected, many international networks of uh, different types, that through excellence and relevance seeks to analyze the global issues that affect political, social, and governance dynamics, from the international to the local perspective. Dr. Morillas is a political scientist and holds a PhD in politics, policies, and international relations from the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, and a master's degree in international relations from the uh, London School of Economics. Uh, previously, he was coordinator of the Political and Security Committee of the Council of the European Union and also advisor on external action, action at the European Parliament. He has published numerous research papers for academic journals and think tanks, uh, like uh, his opinion pieces uh, that cover uh, global dynamics, European integration, European foreign policy, and Euro-Mediterranean uh, relations, among many other subjects. He regularly collaborates with various media outlets uh, here in Spain and uh, European wide, and uh, has been uh, uh, publishing, he published recently a book uh, entitled uh, Strategy Making in the EU, From Foreign and Security Policy to External Action. He also has co-directed, more recently, the highly recommendable documentary named uh, Bouncing Back, World Politics After the Pandemic, that has been 
issued this year, which proposes a reflection on the dynamics of conflict and opportunities for international cooperation in the post-COVID-19 uh, world. We are very honored to, that he has accepted our invitation to give the graduation lecture this year at EBA for our students, for, uh, for you as students of the uh, 2021 class. Dr. Morillas, this is a great pleasure to have you with us today in our graduation ceremony. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for, for, for being here. Thank you, of course, to, to eBay. Um, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here before you have the opportunity to address a um, very distinguished audience of uh, very recently graduated uh, master's degrees from many, many disciplines, and, and, and also uh, doing that in well, together with, with a very uh, remarkable, inspirational um, people for me. Uh, of course, uh, beginning with uh, Justin Jordana, director of eBay, who's been very kind to offer, to offer this opportunity, but also Narcis Serra, who's been my mentor for, for a long time and, and with whom I had the pleasure to collaborate, as well as good friends that I see here in the audience. Uh, Robert Kisak, Elizabeth Johansson, uh, very, very good uh, and appreciated. Um, group of, of, of professionals of international relations. When I was uh, asked to uh, deliver this graduation lecture and, um, and, and, and to try to reflect on some of the key issues in international affairs that I think will define not only today and tomorrow but also the, the, the months and years uh, ahead of us, I thought um, that a good way to start would be to try to put together what I think are two core components, not only of my professional career, but also what I think will be key components of any student, of any interested practitioner in international affairs, and mix the ideas of theory or academia and uh, knowledge in general with the practice of international politics. And to do that, um, I would like first to um, try to address a question to you and try to uh, think together about what I think will be the crucial aspect uh, for uh, the European Union in the years to come. And it is the question of whether uh, Europe can be, or it cannot be, a geopolitical power uh, in the age of uh, current globalization dynamics, uncertainty, conflicts, and, and many of the issues that you, that you will have studied for, cert, uh, for sure in, in, your, in your last uh, year. And the first words, of course, are those to congratulate you. If you are reaching this point, if you are here uh, attending this, uh, this lecture and this uh, ceremony, it means that it's been, despite the circumstances, uh, a, a successful year for you. And uh, also uh, the first words, of course, are to congratulate you who are the real uh, and main characters of this play to, today. But let me go into, into this um, uh, question that I raised at the beginning, can Europe be a geopolitical power, to then address it and say a few words about what's been uh, my career so far in international affairs and some practical small recommendations uh, that, that might also be fit for purpose now that you are looking forward to the next steps. Well, we all know the state of the world we live in, right? I mean, uh, I won't go into detail into that. We are living a post-Western world where great power competition and rivalry between the US and China will be the defining feature of our century to come, where um, zero-sum dynamics between the main powers are gaining strength and everyone is looking after their own interests in this troubled uh, environment, where international institutions are being weakened, where global governance structures do not fulfill the tasks that we would uh, um, ask them uh, to fulfill and that, of course, ahead of these uh, troubling dynamics, global governance is at, uh, at, a, at a low when it comes to the expectations that we have on them and the capacity to deliver uh, on the results that we, that we would expect. As a consequence of that, of course, it's only logical that we act 
uh, that we ask an international actor such as the European Union to adapt to this changing geopolitical reality, to this changing geopolitical landscape. And we ask actually not only us and the public in general, but also political leaders, ask the EU to be more geopolitical, to learn to speak the language of power as uh, the High Representative Josep Borrell put it not so, not so long ago. My big question is, is this possible? And, and, and probably by trying to find an answer to this uh, question, it is not only that we will understand better and, and appreciate better what the EU can do for us, but also what the, the EU can do outside and, and, and how it can contribute to this, to this global environment. But let me deal first with the concept of power. Huh? If we want the EU to be a geopolitical actor, to speak the language of power, what does power mean today and as, as, we, are, as we are speaking on, uh, on the side, or at least from the vision of the European Union. And the truth is that Europe, and when I say Europe, I mean the European Union, was actually built to escape the logics of power. So uh, it aimed to build an international order where power would not be the defining feature, but would actually be one of the features that would eventually give way to more cooperation at the global scene in the same way as the European Union had achieved to do so internally. So in other words, try to project to the outside world the successes of the EU when it comes to its internal construction. And actually, on economy and trade, the idea was progressively to surrender state sovereignty in favor of supranational institutions and common regulatory frameworks on security and defense, relying on the US umbrella, of course. The idea of the European Union was to act as a force for good to the outside world and try to uh, convey this different understanding of the role of defense, of the role of, um, of force in international politics. Or even in global governance, the idea was to pursue a strong system of multilateral governance that escapes or that transcends national interest in favor of global public goods that would be, of course, needed uh, uh, in this more interconnected, this more globalized uh, world uh, today, right? So in other words, um, what we are asking the EU today to do, that is speak the language of power, become more geopolitical, are tasks that are not related to the original DNA structure of the European Union, but that actually have been put at the forefront and that actually demand for the EU to recalibrate the way it interacts and the way it thinks about, uh, about the world. So for instance, on internal, on internal market, the original idea was to eliminate unfair competition between the member states uh, um, and, and, and also state subsidies. But actually today what we are demanding is that the, uh, the internal market defends Europeans against the interference and the interests uh, of other global powers in, in, a, in an environment much more um, characterized by geoeconomic competition. On security and defense issues, from the demilitarization of Europe as the main objective in favor of the transatlantic alliance and NATO, uh, today we see the need to build more capabilities, internal capabilities of the European Union and what some call uh, Europe's strategic uh, autonomy. On technological issues, the first idea or the initial idea was to foster research so that we could actually have more cap in technological capabilities within Europe. And today is actually how to confront a global technological race where technology is often used for uh, hybrid threats purposes or even in the, are a danger for the state of uh, democracies and liberal democracies. And on values, for instance, from the universality of human rights, rule of law, um, and, 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 uh, and democracy, we are witnessing an increased challenge by either autocracies, such as the case uh, uh, of Russia, systems based on development and growth, but without democracy, such as in China, or even illiberal trends within consolidated democracies, uh, such as India, Brazil, or even uh, Hungary. On borders, we were supposed to suppress the borders, and now we are dedicating most of our efforts 
uh, not to reestablish these borders when the pandemic has hit us or when migration challenges also emerge. So on all these issues, the EU is actually asked to make this um, uh, change in the way it thinks about power, the way it thinks about the world it lives in. So as geoeconomic and geopolitical competition rises, then the question becomes even more relevant, right? Because the expectations are that Europe can actually respond to these changing uh, realities. And here, Luke van Middelaar, who's a Dutch philosopher, has put forward three parameters to understand uh, what he calls Europe's geopolitical awakening. On the one hand, power, and what Europe understands by power and how it relates to power, second, territory, and third, narrative. Let me go very briefly into the three of them. On power, we know what the changing real realities are. Power is shifting to the east, the US is pivoting towards Asia, uh, Europe, despite its power on many areas, is losing, if not relevance, at least it's losing centrality in this, in this power shift. US-China, as I said, is the defining feature of our time. And also, this changing dynamics on, of power at the international uh, level also force international actors to recalibrate the dichotomy between values and interests. The European Union was very much aimed at, since the beginning at promoting certain values to the outside world. Well, today, uh, actually, the European Union is, the, is, is asked by governments and citizens to defend its own interests and to recalibrate the way it thinks about values and interests, I was, as I was saying. Um, so also, this reflects the need to change alliances. If alliances are built on the basis of interests, it's not the same as alliances built on the basis of values only, because you will not only need to speak with the like-minded, you will probably also need to speak with those with whom you converge less on values, but with whom you might have similar uh, interests. The alternative doesn't suit us Europeans. Huh? The chacun pour soi or everyone in taking his own destiny in his own hands is not very good for Europeans because of what I was saying at the beginning as the DNA of the European Union. So if we cannot follow our own way of acting only, and we need to work with others, we actually need to increase our capabilities, our capacity to act, and also to increase our strategic autonomy. And third, power today is very much related to something that the European Union was not meant to do either, which is the protection of citizens, right? I mean, the protection of citizens has always been in the hands of the member states of the European Union. And uh, today, we're asking more to the European Union to become l'Europe qui protège, eh? as, uh, to, as, as uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, put it not, uh, not so long ago. So we need a Europe that here also delivers, and that does not embody only an ideal, but actually that puts forward efficient measures, efficient policies to uh, adapt to these power um, realities. Second, on territory. Well, the truth is that despite all the deterioratorialized dynamics that we are witnessing, of course the pandemic being the first one, but also climate emergencies or others, despite the existence of these deterioratorialized threats and phenomena, we tend to discover even more and more that geography still matters. The world is not as flat as they used to say in, in, in Friedman's words. Globalization has caused many fractures within societies and between societies. Inequality is rising also in many well-established democracies, but also between nations in certain, in certain areas. And as a consequence of, uh, of inequality, politics is becoming more contested and politics are becoming more fragmented, right? It's, uh, many of your countries, I'm sure you're witnessing that, the changing political landscape internally and how many forces have come to put forward different recipes uh, ahead of this, um, of this phenomenon. And the EU actually has been discovering the importance of borders in the last few years subsequently. In 2011, when the Arab Spring um, uh, started, uh, instability in Syria or in Libya 
was actually perceived as a threat to Europe's southern border and southern stability, and clearly a border was formed instead of good cooperation dynamics between the two shores of the same sea. And speaking from Barcelona, of course, you know what I am uh, referring to. In 2014, with the invasion of Crimea by Russia, again, borders mattered, now to the east, but very uh, crucially with, um, with the, um, the power-based and rivalries that Russia started in 2014 and continue to this day. In 2015, with the so-called refugee crisis, uh, and Turkey using um, its border and the agreement with the European Union to control the flow of, refugee, of refugees as political leverage. Today, Morocco and Belarus instrumentalizing or even weaponizing migration for interest uh, um, when it comes to the relations with the European Union. And of course, speaking today in early September with the return of the Taliban in Afghanistan, and the possibility that Afghanistan becomes, again, uh, a, um, a security concern for Europeans and beyond, a safe haven for terrorism or the source of refugee flows. Well, again, in Afghanistan, Afghanese borders will still, uh, will still matter. So for Europe, in short, insecurity or threat perception often has a geographic dimension. But in our narrative, and this is the third point, we tended to understand that threat perception and borders were not so much of an importance in the world today. Well, this re-dimension of territory, of course, has made other actors also put more emphasis onto territorial matters. Huh? China with its Belt and Road Initiative, Russia trying to portray that the West is in decay and its time um, has, uh, has gone and interfering in internal affairs through hybrid warfare in, 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 in different democratic um, processes. The US even adopting a narrative and a foreign policy strategy based on internal national interests, not being the police of a borderless, uh, borderless world. Well, all these factors are putting, again, territory more central than uh, what uh, Europe's narrative was, uh, was trying to portray in many of, uh, of its documents. And here comes the third aspect, narrative. Well, narrative is nothing more and nothing less than the way you project yourself as a global actor, as an international actor, to the outside world. In other words, how do you want others to see you when you interact out there as, a, as an actor? And it basically is comprised by four key dimensions. First, you have to have an accurate reading of the global environment, so where are you as an actor? Second, you have to identify quite well the threats that emanate from this global uh, environment. Third, you have to put forward a series of interests that, uh, uh, that uh, you want to pursue when you do foreign policy. And fourth, you have to you have to have the tools, the, capacity, the capabilities, the instruments at your disposal to actually secure this uh, interest that, that you have identified. Well, this has changed tremendously in a decade time long if we see it from a European perspective. In 2003, when the European security strategy was uh, published, uh, we wanted to show to the world that we were a normative power, that we wanted to define the way or at least to, to try to address the world in the same image that we were addressing ourselves. So this, of course, had something uh, to see with the construction of Europe itself. But we tried that the world looked much more like we were to set the normal in, the, in, in international affairs. And that included, of course, uh, global politics based on cooperation, on sharing sovereignty, on multilateral organizations, even what some called uh, postmodern Europe and the demise of, um, of borders and of sovereignty as the defining feature of international uh, affairs. Well, in 2016, when the new strategy was published, so that means 13 years later, um, the EU global strategy is much, it's a much more realist document, in a sense. Huh? It, it, it tries to put forward the idea that the EU needs to defend its own interests 
when it comes to the relations with the outside world, that it needs to protect the citizens, that it needs to act as, a, as an organization that prevents crisis into the generating or generating security threats for the European Union, that we need to build resilience as a, as a way to uh, push back these uh, threats that come to us, that again, we need strategic autonomy to act together with allies, such as the US, but also alone if, uh, if necessary. So in a sense, we've become and we have adapted our narrative to the changing realities in the world out there, to the threats that emanate from this world. But we have been much worse at the other parts of a strategy or of a narrative, which is identifying a shared number of interests and, uh, among the member states. These are still very much far apart when it comes to the Baltic states or when it comes to the Mediterranean or France or Germany. There are still diverging interests. Um, and also at, put, at putting forward the, affecting, the effective sorry, instruments to carry out these, uh, these interests. We are much worse at this second, these two other parts of, uh, of a strategy. And actually, the Taliban um, uh, comeback and the, and the withdrawal of the, of the United States shows the limits to some of the, even not actively, and uh, not fully engaged European strategy in Afghanistan, that of course very much relied on the US more than the Europeans, it actually had an ideology very much based on what the Europeans defense, defend in foreign policy, which is state building, good governance, nation building, call it as you wish. Huh? All these were part of the EU's narrative. And this, uh, in the last month or so, if not, the Europeans, we are not to blame for everything that went wrong because it was actually not in our hands. We have suffered also some sort of mental reality check uh, with, the, uh, with the US withdrawing from, uh, from Afghanistan. And to these three elements, I would add a fourth one that I consider crucial when it comes to the Europe's role in, in global affairs, which is the one referring to institutions and policymaking dynamics. We actually, at the European Union, are still very much caught in ways of taking decisions that are not fit for purpose, that are not fit for being a geopolitical actor. We lack a joint strategic culture at the EU level. We have a lot of national strategic cultures uh, in many uh, member states, which emanate from different histories, different interests, different ways to understand uh, foreign policy or defense issues. And that explains why member states are still so reluctant to give away foreign policy prerogatives that would actually be, or that would need to be given away if the EU were to be a more um, geopolitical actor. And this, of course, comes and is very clearly characterized by the use of unanimity, the veto powers that member states still have on foreign policy decisions. Even on agreed positions, for the last decade or so that are today being blocked by member states. Hungary blocked uh, written conclusions on the Middle East peace process. It also blocked council conclusions on uh, accusing Beijing of cracking down on democracy in Hong Kong. Cyprus refused to back sanctions on Belarus uh, unless the EU imposed sanctions on Turkey too. So all these, and these are just examples, member states still have the capacity to block and to make the EU only reach the lowest common denominator when it comes to uh, shared positions. And the big question mark here is whether we would need to actually build this joint strategic culture or a more political union before we aim at being more geopolitical or before we aim at being a geopolitical actor. This is a question that of course has no answer. Now I'll finish with this um, with this thought. So by, by giving an answer to the question that I raised at the beginning, uh, can Europe be a geopolitical power? Well, the truth is, the need uh, for the EU to be a geopolitical power won't disappear. It's there and it won't disappear anytime soon, not in the coming decades, uh, in the coming years or in the coming decades. But actually, if we want to pursue that objective, we need to rethink the way 
that we understand power, that we conceive power in our heads as Europeans, and also the way we exert and we do foreign policy at the European Union level. We need, first and foremost, to refurbish the way we operate in foreign policy matters if we want to become a geopolitical actor. Otherwise, we will just have done exactly what Christopher Hill told us many years ago, which is raising the expectations on what the EU should be at the global scene and not matching these expectations with the right capabilities, with the right ways to actually uh, fulfill that, uh, that goal. In any case, there is a need in current global affairs, the ones that I briefly described at the beginning, the state of global affairs, there is a need for someone to act as a convener uh, for global powers that puts forward ideas to build effective global governance that refurbish the current structures of global governance because transnational trend, uh, threats won't disappear. And we have known that with the pandemic and we are certain that this will only be the first example of many to come for the need for these uh, global effective global govern, uh, governance structures. So the EU has an opportunity. I've reached this point where when thinking about what I was about to tell you uh, tonight on, on, this, on this lecture, and, and Jacinth asked me, well, you could finish up also with something that, that gives some, uh, some, some ideas on, on, on how to pursue this, right? I mean, what can I do as a young um, and, and recently graduated uh, a scholar at eBay? What can I do to basically um, contribute to this? And give some advice on, on, on how to develop careers that is a stage like this when you are celebrating, and of course you should, uh, also, and very often comes to mind the question, well, where do I go now, what do I do, uh, and so on. And I, and I basically saw when building these short comments that I made on, 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 on the topic uh, that I just uh, raised, that I was actually very much doing what I've always done in my, in my career so far, which is basically mixing a bit uh, research, knowledge, uh, and now from Think Tank, from CDOP um, as a director, with practice and action, with the way that things happen and, and the structures that make things happen and interacting with, this, with these structures. So by combining thinking and action, I think that this is, some of the, uh, this is a clear feature of something that will be needed more and more. People that are able not only to act as traditional pure diplomats, or act only as researchers and academics of international affairs, but that will have the ability to speak both uh, languages. So how to pursue that? Well, the first basic assumption is you have to more or less identify what your inner feelings tell you, right? There are people more prone to research that love engaging in depth with very crucial discussions and that want to understand them better and to even teach them to others. Uh, this thing. Well, then that is research. If you want to basically explain things that happen, follow the news and be able to, um, to identify those trends in order to make a rapid assessment, well, this is more related to journalism. Or perhaps you are people that want to actually do things and then you want to basically be in action. You, want, you might want to consider a public official position. You might want to pursue a concours at the European Union level or at your national foreign services. At the end of the day, this all comes to what you think you are good at, to what drives you internally. There's no way to pursue a PhD if you think that research can be too much of a burden, right? So first uh, task, of course, is to identify this as, as your light motif for the different hurdles that you will necessarily be confronting in any of these areas. But second, and this is my, my key uh, advice here, uh, I would say that if you decide that you are a thinker, then try to mingle as much as you can with doers, right? I mean, even try to be at some point a doer for a while, through an internship, through a, an exchange with someone, because Many good ideas, at the end of the day, are confronted to very harsh institutional realities and very rigid frameworks on which these ideas are confronted. So you need to understand the way things operate at the global level if you want to make a solid uh, research contributor. But if you are a doer, then 
you must cultivate your thinker, because your thinking. Because uh, doers now, today, policymakers, diplomats, whoever you, you, you think about as a, as a doer, is much more exposed than before to the state of politics, to the politicization dynamics, to the contestation of many things, to the fact that there are social media out there influencing the way you do politics. So you actually need, if you become a doer, to be much more aware and much more knowledgeable about what um, thinkers are uh, producing. So in short, I would say that databases and, and, and quantitative and qualitative research are very welcome, very necessary, but in international affairs, as in any social science, direct observation is really needed and is really necessary. Try to gain some field experience. If you are discussing Afghanistan and you've never been to Afghanistan and you don't know that it's quite a rocky um, uh, country with plenty of mountains, that will never help you understand the realities out there. So if you have the chance to get some field experience, that will certainly make a much better professional in international affairs, no matter uh, what you do. And I will end with just one personal um, uh, circumstances that occurred to me when I was working at the Political and Security Committee of the European Union that Jacinth referred to um, at the beginning and surrounded by diplomats. I was the only one not being a diplomat working at the PSC at that um, PSC Political Security Committee at that moment. I was working with the Spanish ambassador to the PSC. Well, I remember that I had a strong interest coming from the place that I was coming from, which is research, academia, or uh, knowledge in general. I had a strong interest to make some meetings, hybrid meetings between think tankers, NGO, um, uh, professionals, uh, academics, or anyone interested in the state of EU foreign policy to actually have the opportunity in a monthly meeting to discuss with the PSC ambassador on the state of, um, of, of affairs at the EU level and they could e exchange views. Well, in one of those meetings, I remember getting out of the meeting and being together with a colleague at that point um, with a, a senior diplomat, today a very senior diplomat at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who told me something along these lines. She said, well, you see all these people that were in the meeting referring to think tankers, NGO practitioners and so on. All these people were people that wanted to be diplomats at some point and that didn't succeed in becoming a diplomat. And now they want to have the opportunity to basically learn a bit from us and, um, and, and, and engage with us diplomats, what we are actually doing and the way we are doing the work. And I was shocked totally by the difficulty to actually understand that both worlds, the thinking and the practitioner were actually bore, uh, were actually self-reinforcing and needed to have some, uh, some uh, deeper uh, collaboration. So in short, my strongest advice for all of you is please prove this diplomat wrong and be able as much as you can to put together theory and practice, knowledge and action as a good uh, international affairs practitioner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morillas, for your uh, clear and very interesting views about uh, the challenges of the European Union to, to become a, a global power, but also for, for your reflections on this theory and practice that is something that is really very important. And it's also something that we try to struggle at the way, also try ways to combine both dimensions in, in a very fruitful way for, for, for training and for process of learning at, uh, for our students here at Ebay. So thank you, thank you very much for your insights. So, and now uh, is the, the time for uh, the addresses to the students uh, from Ebay faculty and students. And we'll start with uh, Leslie Ann Daniels, professor of Ebay, in, is going to address uh, students in the name of Ebay faculty.
Honorable guests, esteemed colleagues, wonderful class of 2021, of the Masters in International Development, the Masters in International Security, and the Research Masters in International Studies, families and friends, welcome. I'm honored to be here with you and to represent the eBay faculty in saying a few words. And firstly, I want to speak to the students. This has not been a normal year. You've been called on to make unexpected changes and to work in unexpected ways. Some of you were expecting to be here in 2020 and you had to change to part-time to be able to get through your degree. But you are here today. You are all here today. You made it. On behalf of the faculty, I want to say first and foremost, Congratulations. Secondly, I want to say thank you to the family and the friends. Sons and daughters ended up back at home, studying in their old bedrooms. Friends had to find space in shared flats so that everybody could log into classes. You had to listen to the worries, the complaints, the stresses. This award is at least in part due to your support Thank you to you all. This year was not what we predicted. And the future is not what we thought it would be even just a few years ago. I feel there have been many turning points in the world in the last year. And I want to reflect on a few of them because this is the world that you will be going into. I want to concentrate on three areas. The first is the threat to the multilateral order. Multilateral institutions have been tested in the last few years, and in many cases, they've been found wanting. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic exposed weaknesses in the World Health Organization. It was slow to respond. It had no power to, to impose a united strategy. It couldn't enforce an investigation into the causes. It couldn't impose vaccine sharing in the better interests of the whole population of the world. The Syrian conflict has shown the defects of the United Nations system. The permanent members could veto actions, leaving space for the Syrian regime to commit atrocities and to end up in control of the country. In issues of key importance to the international order, defense, security, Finance. Nations are increasingly going their own way, as our esteemed speaker also referred to. And I think moving into the future that this is going to be one of the most important features that you will have to face. Some of you will work in those multilateral institutions. So what do you do? Do you lead change from within? Some of you will be working for your national governments. Will you help your nations re-engage with the multilateral order? Or will you push for a unilateral solutions? The world is changing, and some of you in this room will shape that change. You need to decide what future do you want. The second aspect I want to, headlight, to highlight where I think we're seeing a new future is the power of words. There's been a key turning point in how words can have real-life consequences. We've seen how misinformation about the vaccines distorted the response to the pandemic and ultimately affected all of us. The blanket response of fake news has weakened the power of journalists to investigate governments and hold them to account. And this has diminished people's trust in government. Social media algorithms have spread abuse of information that have led to massacres in places like Myanmar. Again, this is the world that you are inheriting. Some of you will work for non-government organizations or for lobby groups. Some of you will work for your country's diplomatic services or the government press office. How will you combat misinformation? What will truth mean for you? The final aspect I want to talk about is how, for this generation, the personal has become political. 
We see this in the way that people identify with their nation and they want their nation to be strong. People identify with leaders that speak for them and we see the rise of populism. But we also see it in how people are judged on social media for their values, for their beliefs, and even for the labels that they put on themselves. Who you are matters in a way that is different from previous generations. So who will you be in this world? What values and beliefs will you prioritize? I hope that some of the things you've learned this year will help you in this future that you're facing. And I'm not talking just about understanding how the United Nations works. Though obviously, as one of the faculty, I do think that's really important. I'm thinking more about the broader lessons you've learned. The training that you've had in assessing information, tracing statements back to find the original reference, evaluating the reliability of sources, using logic, testing arguments. The core values that you've developed through working with others of tolerance, of support, of solidarity. You've made networks here at eBay that we hope will last into your future. And we certainly want you to be part of the alumni network. Particularly from this year, you've learned to adapt in the face of the unexpected. You have found that you have enormous resilience adaptability and perseverance. Not only have you earned your master's degree, but you earned them in this pandemic year. In conclusion, this year you have learned a lot from us, we hope. We have learned a lot from you, and you have learned a lot about yourselves. The world that awaits you is at many turning points. I've highlighted some of them. You have the skills, and you are at a moment in history where you have the opportunities to shape the world that we will live in. I want to leave you with one overriding purpose, and I'm going to take a quote from the author, Toni Morrison. She said, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. Class of 2021, I wish you all the best in your futures. Thank you very much, Wesley. And now is the turn of uh, uh, Kenesia uh, Rodinova, uh, student of the Masters of International <laughs> Development. Good evening. Good evening, professors, students, guests. It is a great honor to be here today addressing the graduating cohort of 2021. I believe I'm not exaggerating when I say that this year has posed numerous opportunities as well as challenges to all of us. We are a diverse bunch from all backgrounds and previous experiences. We each have our own strengths, as well as our own fears and worries. But we all share a passion for quote unquote, saving the world, sometimes forgetting that we need to save ourselves first. I'll start with some of the challenges. While learning the nuance of renting in Barcelona, figuring out what paperwork needs to be done for visas and NIA or TIA cards, which insurance is accepted, and how the online appointments, or CITAs, are an entire complex process of the Spanish bureaucracy. I heard the phrase, adulting is hard, as a form of stress release. 
Not to mention that some of us have already forgotten how to study since our bachelor's degrees. And as a result of the past year, we've learned a new skill of reading over 50 pages overnight to extract the key points from the assigned readings. We were sure to complain about the unfathomable workload, but we continue to dedicate due effort re um, realizing that towards the end of the year that a 2,000 word essay that took us about two weeks to write at the start of the first term can actually be done in a few hours. We've also been working on overcoming language barriers and finding multilingual friends amongst us, giving us the opportunity to complain in all the different languages that we know on the beach over Laura Sangria. <laughs> I apologize, this is a reference that's better known to the development group. And as a special, um, as a side thank you to Lorenzo for helping to create a WhatsApp group at the start of September. Um, by emailing every one of us in the development stream before he even met us. This group has become a place where we shared information, where we contacted each other for help, and of course, organized parties. But seriously, this year has also provided us numerous opportunities to explore a variety of eye-opening courses and a chance to appreciate the importance of the work that we all aspire in our future career paths. We are citizens of the world, and international studies is a deliberate choice. I personally have struggled with the perceived weight of, on my shoulders to find solutions to the 21st century problems. But after speaking to a lot of other students, I've realized that we all have our doubts and anxieties about how to do the right thing and find meaningful jobs that will help people in any and every community without discrimination. Social justice, human rights, and sustainable solutions drive us to study more, to form connections, and to search for answers to questions that may have never yet been posed. And I urge you, friends, to keep this passion and drive throughout your lives, our lives. The choices we make matter. The work that we do will make a difference. And we don't all need to become prime ministers in order to have an influence on policies. We don't need to be Greta Thunberg to speak up about our concern for the environment. Every choice is a choice. And when you choose to act out of kindness, compassion, empathy, and care, these actions will make a difference, no matter which job you end up in. Finally, of course, as already has been mentioned, we cannot forget about the added challenge that we had this year, as well as an opportunity that arose for all of us, including, of course, directors, program coordinators, our professors and students too. Yes, I'm speaking about the pandemic, online classes and poor internet connection. But the desire to make meaningful connections and take the opportunity that this program has provided by gathering students here from all over the world has kept us going. And this is why despite restrictions and online platform failures, masks covering our faces and evening curfews, we still found ways to meet discuss what matters to us, and form friendship groups, and even create an environmental student association. This is the first student association at eBay. And a special thank you to the founders, Nausicaa and Julia. <laughs> and Professor Charles Broger, who helped to make it happen. Unfortunately, we students have also taken turns getting sick with the virus, having to overcome fear while facing difficult decisions and learning to approach the topic with sensitivity and responsibility. This pandemic is a practical lesson, so to speak, because it applies in all our areas of study, development, security, and research. It is a real example of how important international studies are in our current global world, and how it is vital that we work together in order to stand a chance at solving 
the challenges that we face. I've had a, the great opportunity and privilege to meet and study with some brilliant young people in this course. I cannot mention everyone now, but believe me, there are many great stories to share. To conclude, I would like to thank eBay and every individual from the admissions, academic office, IT support, directors, and every one of our professors, all of whom had to adjust flexibly to all the unexpected situations that the year has presented. A sincere thank you. And I personally congratulate you all students for having the courage and determination to be here and to complete this degree. I wish everyone success with your definition of success. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Kanisha. Uh, and now is the uh, turn of uh, Vivian Ogu from the uh, Masters in International Security. Sorry, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jordana, Mr. Morillas, Mrs. Daniels, and Ksenia for your words. Thank you to all the teachers for your patience and support during this difficult year. Thank you to the administrative office and the direction of the university for your adaptability and willingness to make this graduation happen. Thank you to our families, friends, and loved ones for your patience and unconditional love. And of course, thank you to my fellow students for pushing through and arriving here. We are graduating class 2021. A couple of... <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, I was lying on my bed, writing some thoughts for this speech. I was a bit nervous. I didn't know what you expected or how to make this few minutes an open letter to your fears and ambitions. But then I realized that no matter how awful or inspiring I am today, because in 20 years, you won't, you won't remember a word. The couple of hours we spend here are completely insignificant in comparison to the memories we're about to build. So I told myself, why instead of speaking to the new graduates, I speak to the future scholars, ministers, humanitarian workers, policy makers, peace builders, and entrepreneurs you'll become. I was really excited by the idea, so I called a friend and I told her, hey, I have the speech. I'm sure they will love it. But she laughed and said, Vivian, are you sure the young adults you'll be speaking to are aware of their potential? Will they connect with your words? I think she was right. I know that many of you are already aware of your potential. I've been hearing about your aspirations and the incredible careers you are building. At your young age, you're truly making an impact. And this master's degree has served, for you, has served you for learning more and advancing towards your goals. But I also know that many are still figuring things out. You have big dreams, but are not sure where to start. This degree was about getting the knowledge and environment to meet like-minded people, access a job, and of course, enjoy Barcelona. But instead, you found a pandemic and virtuality. So I think my task today is to encourage the first group to keep working with passion, ethics, and humility, and convince the leader of your potential and how important it is for the world that you find your purpose and power. So now I'm gonna do something that I'm a bit afraid of, um, and it's to share a story with you. It is a story uh, of moving from a disempowered girl to an empowered woman. And I think that many of you will relate either today or in the future. When I was 16 years old, I was very afraid of life. I suffered from bullying for four years. I got depressed. I was diagnosed with an eating disorder and I had to leave school for a year. 
The only thing that encouraged me to wake up in the morning was a vision of improving the global dynamics, helping to end world hunger, building peace, and end ending people's suffering. But I didn't believe in myself. I didn't believe I could. I thought I wasn't intelligent enough or skillful. But three years ago, I decided that my potential will be bigger than my fear. And I started to take some action every day. Whether working on my habits, planning my career, learning new skills, and starting to love myself. I jumped from association to association. I started to speak up for the things I cared about. And I repeated myself, I am capable. And one day, I woke up with a conference proposal, and invitations started to come one after another. If someone had told the challenged teenager that one day she would be at the parliament demanding the Spanish politicians to promote youth rights, I would have love. But today, I know that when I started to believe in me, I created the person I wanted to be. So I think the best commitment you can do when we walk out of here is to believe in you. Unleash your potential, own your voice, visualize where you want to go, and wake up every day taking small actions. It is not going to be easy, you already know. You may get many jobs rejections, you may be underestimated, discriminated against, but your potential is bigger than your fear. And let me tell you that when I look through this room, I feel inspired by knowing that each of you is going to do amazing things in the world. And someday, you'll be sitting on your coach, reflecting on your life, and feeling very, very, very proud of the path you've taken. The world we live in needs as small actions from all of us. It needs to explore our potential. Many threats are challenging our societies. We are in the middle of an, of, in the middle of an industrial revolution. Wars look like getting closer. Poverty and inequality are increasing. However, more and more people are aware of how colonial, patriarchal, and racist systems are some of the power dynamics causing many of these challenges. It's a consciousness awake by education. And now that we're going to the real world, we must be ready to develop a new type of leadership. A leadership that values the we instead of the I, and that values collaboration instead of competition. A professor once told me we shouldn't use the term international community as we are not one yet. But I'm sure our generation will make sure we are an international community. And for doing so, I think the leaders we are about to become need to remember some valuable, valuable principles our professors taught us. So, when sitting in your office, writing a proposal for a development project, please remember we are working for people with agency, not beneficiaries. When you are on the plane moving to start the position of our dreams, please remember that we are also working for the migrants dying at the sea. When we are writing for a prestigious journal about what happens very, from, very far away, please remember to amplify the voices of the communities and avoid repeating the only history. When you are implementing a peace building process, please remember the responsibility to empower the people to progress peacefully and not to perpetuate violence. And when you win your first elections, that I know many of you will do someday, remember democracy is about bridging the voices and interests of diverse people. Definitely, what I'm trying to say is, remember to unleash your potential in their service to humanity and to a better peaceful world. Now my words are coming to an end. So let me ask you one last thing. When I finish talking and you applaud, please, don't applaud me, applaud yourself. Applaud the resilient student you have been. Applaud the powerful person you've become. And applaud the outstanding leader that in some years will be improving a parcel of the world. Be proud of yourself, this is your moment. Be proud of all the efforts you and your families have put to celebrate graduating today. And as you head to the future, take action small actions every day. Thank you for listening.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Viviana. With her intervention, uh, we finish here the, the series of uh, uh, speeches uh, addressed to the, to the students. And now we will start uh, with the conferment of the Greece. I will ask uh, uh, Professor Joan Guardia, Rector of the University of Barcelona, and Professor Narcis Serra, President of IBEI, to, to join the, the presidential table. And then we'll start uh, with the uh, conferment. Uh, Robert uh, Kisak, uh, Head of Studies of IBEI, is going to uh, read uh, uh, your names uh, and give you some other instructions about how we are going to organize this conferment of the Greece. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'd like to just give a few words of instruction to our graduates today. Uh, they're getting into place because I've already briefed them, but I'll just say very briefly how this is going to work. What we would like to do is I will read a name, and the students will be waiting in a line. When I read the name, would you please come up and receive uh, your diploma certificate? Uh, please only touch the paper. Uh, unfortunately, this year there can be no handshakes uh, but just take the paper, and then we would like to gather three of you, and then this wonderful lady here will take a photo here. And then if you could then pass back down and rejoin your seat. And as soon as the last person, or the last few people are there, if the next row could begin to file out, and it should all work well. We will interrupt from time to time, because we have some people online, and we will recognize them with uh, their picture and, and details on the screen. So if we're all ready, and for the third time lucky, because we've done this three times today, and fingers crossed it's going to go well, I'd like to begin. So please, Alba Calvo, please come up. <laughs> Marina Karik. <laughs> Francisca Chayla. Paola Chiriliano. <laughs> Albert Cuyel. <laughs> Margot Dandeflos. Maite Dublin. Martino Fabris. And Manon Leprince. Vivian Ongo. <laughs> Salima Perez. <laughs> Masika Vaninetti. And hold on one second, if we could please also call up uh, Christina Zakariaki. <laughs> so we have four together. Thank you very much. And we also have two people online. So the first of them is Abdallah Hussein Abdallah, who's in Kenya. And Hyun Wook Shin. So that ends the people from the Masters of International Security, and I'll go on to the Masters of International Development. So Francisca Araya. Yeah. 
Lucretha Bosio. Ro Lorenzo Colinassi. Margot Desert. We have no Margot. Daniela Evora. <laughs> Louise Lacour. <laughs> Lea Las Piñas. Next up, Carolina Martinez. <laughs> Lorenzo Mello. <laughs> Alberto Montagnola. Andrea Navarro. <laughs> Rebecca Quechano. <laughs> Ksenia Redonova. Genero Rua, Rua, no, Ruano. <laughs> Mariana Ruiz. <laughs> Jordi Segarra. Julia Spencer. <laughs> Laura Stamm. <laughs> Sarah Sanolovic. Nausika to Rubia. Uh, Diego Vallero. Elsa Winterhalter. And finally, last but not, never least, these people have worked for two years. These are the real heroes of living through COVID because they've done it not for one semester or two, but for three. So first up, uh, we have um, Noor El Muzine. <laughs> Teddy Baker. <laughs> Philip Kitman. and Isabella Shivi.
right. Well, if I may just speak for a couple of moments. The first thing to say is that this is the third graduation we've had today. And if I had been told uh, this morning how much uh, it would be a pleasure to be in all three of them, I think I would have thought I was crazy or I would be trying to lie. The thing which always strikes me, and I've been to many graduations, the, the, the words from the professors and from the students, and I've had three from professors today, heard three professors speak and five students. And on one hand, it's interesting because a graduation ceremony is from the staff side at the beginning of another Groundhog Day, right? We're just going to start again in a few weeks with new students. And for you as graduates, it's the beginning of a whole new future where you leave us and, and, and go and do wonderful things, as, as Vivian said. But for me, what struck me sitting there today, it's two things. The first is that these words that people stand here and deliver are so meaningful. I've never seen colleagues as nervous as they are when they're speaking. And I've, I rarely hear students speak about these things because obviously we're trying to get them to provide answers to questions that were uh, part of the assessment of their learning. They speak from the heart, and the staff, my colleagues too, speak from the heart. And I think it's the, for me personally, it really reminds me, and it gives me great uh, energy and enthusiasm to keep going for the next year and to do better, because I'm struck by how much energy, enthusiasm, passion, empathy, and resilience there is. And that it gets me every year, but this year more than ever. So I would like to thank an enormous thank you to my colleagues, uh, both Leslie Ann right now, but Andrea Bianculli and Borgavitska this morning, and also the students who have spoken today in the previous sessions, and to all of you, because I know the sentiments which they speak on your behalf are, are shared with you as well. You've done wonderfully well. We've had a very trying couple of years. And if there's one other thing I might very briefly say, crisis, we've talked about it so much. The word crisis comes from the Greek uh, the moment of decision or the moment of judgment. In the last two years, we have had to take decisions as an institution which we've, like everyone, we were unprepared for. And throughout it all, we have had, I personally, as head of studies, have had amazing support from the student representatives this year and last year who have had an enormous input. And we've taken decisions together. And with the help of the director, with the manager, uh, Ana Ricard with Academic Office and Mariona Fernandez and the students backing when we've tried to explain what needs to be done and how we can achieve it I, we could not have gotten through to the extent that we have without the students helping from, from their side taking decisions with us crisis means a moment to decide and they co-decided with us and so I can't really speak of any higher uh, praise of, of the dedication of the delegates and of the students behind them to, to listen and heed to our words and to help us get through this. So thank you all. Thank you for your dedication and patience. Thank you for reminding me why we are here and what we're trying to achieve and go forth and I hope you have very successful careers. Well, just a few words to thank the rector of the University of Barcelona, Professor Juan Guardia, for being here with us in this ceremony. Uh, we'll be very honored if you address the audience as the closing uh, intervention of the ceremony of graduation. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Uh, bona tarda a tothom, uh, good evening and everybody and first of all I apologize for my delay, uh, an urgent and important question about the pandemic situation requiring my, my presence and attention, I apologize. And uh, first of all, second, thank you very much for inviting me to this graduation ceremony. Thank you very much to the organization of these masters and thank you especially to the students who are present, people from administration and the professors who made this event possible. Usually, this type, this kind of events are used to be classified as a protocolary event and with a certain uh, festive tone or idea. And that is strictly true. Today is a moment of celebration 
and enjoying in the rewards of many efforts and work. Incorporating in your CV the graduation of a Master of Quality, Prestige, and Intensity as the Institute of Haring is not a minor topic, all the upper right. But in addition to the deserved celebration, I want to give you two more messages associated with the higher education at the level that which you are. This message that are fully compatible with the celebration, but I want to remember you uh, of the transcendence of the moment and that, uh, that also justify the celebration of this act. The first one is no other than the engagement, commitment. You are reaching the latest steps of the path of the higher education process, a process that never stops at all. But you are close to the highest level in academic accreditation, and having such credentials requires you to maintain an engagement with science, rigor, critical thinking, and a general sense of knowledge. That means that you, who have the knowledge as a vital partner, must put it at the service of the common destiny and dedicate it to a more just society and a more balanced world. The second message focuses on the idea of the future that you represent. It is not an abstract idea. It's a concrete and tangible idea. Your professor, your teachers, the technical staff, the administration, and if you want, also your families and friends, we all see in you the, projector, the projection of the future. And it then argument lies the magic of this act. Also today, we celebrate the inauguration of the future. You represent our bet on the future, and that bet is only logical. It's not only logical. It's unquestionable. So in addition to the evidence celebration, you represent the perfect binomium to be treated. Binomium of commitment, engagement, and future. And that idea you must always remember. I wish you the greatest of success, the maximum happiness, and that you enjoy a long life full of intense moments you are the testimony, and the future, future will be better, sure. Thank you very much.